Um, so, you know, this develop, I mean, let me just state, that, you know, the field is developing very rapidly, but, uh, and these models are relatively new, but it's really just getting mainstream attention recently. Uh, this field has been around for quite a while. Um, and uh, yeah, so this will be the subject of my next lecture. But for now, we'll focus on machine learning. Uh, a step back, you know, what you want to do when you're actually going to apply this stuff to real problems. Um, there's several steps that you need to go through to make sure that uh, you're not going to be uh, just throwing it at the, the model and getting uh, junk results, <laughs> which is uh, very likely to happen. So um, the steps go as follows. So for every problem, you're going to need some kind of data preparation. Uh, there's extract, transform, and load, ETL uh, paradigm. Uh, this is because most data is uh, all over the place and not in a form that can be worked with yet. And uh, previously, uh, you probably, I think there was a lecture on that, on uh, pandas and NumPy and Python. And so you'll have to use those skills to actually prepare the data, usually into some kind of a numeric form uh, so that you can use it for these types of algorithms. Uh, you need to do some kind of data normalization. Um, you know, you need to know the normalization, the distribution of your data, and potentially correct it so that it's all aligned, uh, or you get biases uh, when you start applying machine learning uh, that uh, are very difficult to overcome. Uh, the next phase is this uh, data exploration phase. So you can apply so-called unsupervised methods, which we'll talk about, and various visualization methods to get a sense of what's there in your data and make sure you can account for various outliers. Finally, you'll need to actually select a model from the vast array of different models that are available to apply. Uh, you'll have to train that model and make sure that it's uh, doing good um, and actually generalizing to, to new data. And then you'll have to, of course, scrutinize uh, that model. Um, one thing I'll note is you should always be nervous if your model is perfect or doing very well, uh, because it's very likely that it's cheating in some way and you have to figure out how. So I'll go dig a little bit deeper into the data normalization. So this is kind of the early step. Uh, you need to do this for several reasons, including uh, just biases across the dimensions. So if you consider this particular figure over here and you ask about uh, one of these points at the bottom, how close is it to other points? You'll notice that this other axis, axis because it's so large, um, is irrelevant in telling about the distance between those points. Uh, and because of this, you know, all, the only axis that will matter to any model you train on this uh, will be this bottom axis. Uh, but if you standardize this data uh, on both axes, you can see that the points are much more, you know, distributed in such a way that these distances are comparable on both dimensions. So this is you know, one of the many reasons you need to normalize. Another reason is just uh, assumptions of various models and numeric stability. Uh, if your num numbers are extremely large, uh, you could exceed the capacity of, of your computer to actually store them. Uh, so for many of these reasons, you'll want to normalize. Um, most models uh, want your data to be a normal distribution or Gaussian. Uh, and on the right here, we have B, figure B, which shows uh, various types of uh, distributions, uh, Weeble, chi squared, log normal, uniform. And you can apply these various uh, normalization methods and ultimately get a Gaussian distribution out of it. Um, and this fundamentally is what you would want to start doing for almost every, uh, every problem. 
uh, but different normalization uh, will not be applicable if you have certain types of outliers. Um, so it's something you need to look at uh, on a you know problem by problem basis. Um, moving on to kind of this model selection aspect, uh, we have a few broad classes of machine learning approaches. So there's the supervised learning. Uh, when you're doing supervised learning, you're training a model uh, on paired sample and labels. So you know what you want the model to predict and you have examples um, and you're going to train this model so that anytime it's given uh, one of these pairs, it can predict the pair properly. Um, and examples of these models are linear regression, uh, decision trees, and, and feed forward neural networks, which we'll talk about later. Um, there's unsupervised learning, which in contrast to supervised learning doesn't involve any labels that you give it. Uh, unsupervised learning involves uh, getting innate information out of the data without giving any labels whatsoever. Um, and some examples of this are clustering, uh, anomaly detection, which is part of clustering, and uh, a decomposition like uh, PCA, you know, projecting your data into lower dimensions does not require you to give any labels about your data. So all these types of approaches that are augmenting your data in some way or labeling them uh, could fall under this category of unsupervised approaches. Uh, then we have semi-supervised learning. Uh, this is a mix between the two. Uh, you may have some labeled samples, uh, some pairs, and a corpus of, of many unlabeled samples. And the goal really is to try to use the few labeled samples you have and uh, basically predict uh, on the unlabeled set as well. Uh, and there's various uh, approaches uh, that are becoming more popularized in the deep learning space. Um, and there's also other approaches you can do with regular machine learning, um, but that is the gist of, of that. Uh, finally, this category of reinforcement learning is a bit uh, different from the rest. Uh, and we're trying to train a model to uh, perform the best action that's gonna maximize some reward function. So it's very agent oriented. Um, and uh, most of the algorithms are, you know, play games or something. But uh, reinforcement learning more and more is being applied. Many ideas from reinforcement learning are being applied to semi supervised and unsupervised learning areas as well. So it's becoming more and more relevant. Um, so drilling down into supervised learning, uh, there's two types of this terminology of regression and classification. So a regression is when the output variable is continuous. Uh, so in this figure, we have a linear regression model trying to learn these samples that were generated based on adding random noise to a sine wave. Um, and you can see that the linear regression just draws a line. So that is the capability of this particular model. Um, and uh, it does its best to fit all the points. Um, and uh, similarly, we have this support vector machine, um, which draws a presumably better line um, and uh, gets a better score. Uh, both of these are trying to predict this continuous variable, uh, which is the y-axis. Um, for the point position given the x-axis. Uh, so that's anytime you have this continuous output variable, it's a regression problem. And whenever your um, output variable is discrete, uh, it's called a classification problem. So when you have uh, particularly two classes, you know, in or out, it's just a binary classification problem. Uh, so you can see in this figure, uh, we're trying to separate uh, these dots that are either filled in or not. Uh, and again, we have these different lines corresponding to different classifiers, uh, which are doing this to varying degrees of success. Um, and again, different when you use different models, 
they draw these decision boundaries in different ways or or they fit they have different limitations um, we have in the more than binary uh, we have the multi-class or multi-label case so multi-class is when you're just trying to predict one label of a group um, and multi-label is when you could have like several combinations of those labels um, in the same sample. Um, so importantly, you know, if you give like two different uh, values to a multi-class classifier, it's going to predict one or the other, um, not both, uh, and that can have varying, uh, you know, effects. But in general, multi-label classification is much more difficult to do than uh, multi-class. Um, still in supervised learning, we have uh, linear models. So linear models, even though I showed you uh, one trying to learn a sine wave, it just drew this line and it looks very bad. Uh, linear models are heavily used in statistics and they are extremely effective and a very good first choice. Um, some, you know, linear model algorithms include linear regression uh, for continuous output. Um, some, there's a logistic regression where you can actually use it for binary output uh, and you can get linear models to also do multi-label and multi-class classification as well. Um, we have elastic net, uh, which is just another linear model with various uh, penalties. So uh, you just draw a line. So why is it so useful? Well, part of the reason is that lines are very easy to interpret, <laughs> um, you know, and even though we're looking at these, uh, these regression problems, in most uh, problems you have very high dimensionality. Um, and a lot of times, at the in the higher dimensions, your problem is separable uh, by a line, and it's going to be a lot more interpretable. You can apply various statistics to it. Um, and finally, if you do know the distribution of your data, for instance, this here I know is an exponential, um, I can actually apply a transformation to the data, and the linear regression will work uh, spectacularly. Um, so, you know, if you really dig into your data and you know something innate about it, you can eventually get a linear regression model to fit to it. Uh, and then lots of useful statistics will follow. So definitely um, don't discount linear models, even though they're just linear. Um, on the unsupervised learning side of things, uh, there's dimensionality reduction. Uh, and this, I believe, Alex Lockman probably went over in the previous lecture. But uh, this is all about projecting very high dimensional data, which often has many collinearities, many uh, redundant uh, amounts of information into lower dimensions uh, where di redundancy is reduced. Um, and in this figure A, we have a bunch of different manifold learning or manifold is just another word for a lower dimensional projection. Um, so we're just taking these high dimensional data set, which is this S, and we're trying to put it in two dimensions in this case. And you can see how these different algorithms uh, do, you know, some can show you like the S and you can get a grasp for what it actually was in the high dimensional space. Others do more abstract things to it. Um, and uh, that's just kind of the name of the game. Each algorithm will do have certain trade-offs um, and uh, some algorithms that I'll note are PCA, uh, which is a linear transformation, uh, which will kind of take in the first dimensions of PCA will be the highest covariance um, of the high dimensional space. Um, and so PCA is pretty uh, nice and widely used. Um, and I like this figure B to explain a little bit about how PCA exactly is working. Um, 
essentially you're trying to project uh, this two-dimensional object onto this one-dimensional object, this line, um, and you want to find the place where the points are separated the most. Uh, and that's the the direction you're going to, the angle you're going to choose. Um, and so you could see, you could choose this whole 360 degree uh, of possible ways you could project from two dimensions to one dimension, and they choose this uh, line through it, uh, which maximally separates the points. And this happens, you know, from the very high dimensions all the way down to the low dimensions. Um, and another one I'll mention is uh, TSNI and uh, UMAP. Um, on figure C, we have an example of uh, UMAP, and this is uh, the MNIST data, which is actually uh, like handwritten zero through nine digits uh, projected into a low dimensional space. And you can see that UMAP is able to separate the actual digits uh, as points on this plot. And uh, I think Alex went over some of this, but uh, yeah, that's dimensionality reduction, a type of uh, unsupervised learning. Another type of unsupervised learning we have is clustering. Uh, again, on the right, on A, we have a slew of different uh, clustering uh, algorithms being applied to uh, various uh, layouts of point clouds. Um, and you can see that uh, regardless of which clustering algorithm you use, it will be good at some uh, types of point clouds and bad at others. Um, so this is just something to be aware of. Every model has some strengths and weaknesses. Uh, some very important clustering algorithms to be aware of are k-means, um, which is by far like one of the more simple uh, algorithms. Uh, you take k points and you try to uh, make sure that uh, you get points, you divide up all the points into k points, and you just assign the ones to clusters furthest away from each other. Um, and uh, the other one that's used heavily in biology is uh, Leiden. Um, and we can see in C an example of the Leiden algorithm in action from the paper. Um, it's got a lot of steps, but it ultimately involves building this graph uh, structure where points that are neighbors with one another and subclusters that are neighbors with each other are positioned together and assigned similar class labels. Um, and finally, there's hierarchical clustering, uh, which is used heavily in transcriptomics as well. Um, and in hierarchical clustering, at every level of the hierarchy, you want to split the set into two, um, like the best split that you can come up with um, that will ensure that each side is as similar as possible, right? So that gives these uh, dendrogram type visualization. Um, and uh, when you um, do this, you can oftentimes get these like clusters, they look like boxes uh, if you do a correlation matrix. So um, that's clustering. Um, another supervised learning approach, uh, I mentioned linear models. Uh, now we have decision trees. So decision trees uh, have many more parameters than linear models usually, uh, which makes them more powerful um, they're also potentially more interpretable than your average deep learning algorithm, uh, but they still have limitations. Uh, some of those limitations come from having so many parameters. Um, and, you know, if you're, you can use these trees, and if you have a small tree, like in this example, um, you can actually dissect it and you can see how it came to that decision um, by following each branch. Um, so in this particular decision tree, uh, you can see that the data was categorized into these five different uh, segments and you had these two variables, start and age, and the decision tree was 
was set up so that it picked these arbitrary cutoffs to categorize the data points. And this is how these decision trees work. Um, you can view it as a tree. You can also view it as this decision surface. Um, so I guess, you know, I can, this three dimensional one is a little hard to comprehend until you see the one on the, uh, the ones on the right. So here is a decision tree trying to learn uh, the sine wave. We can see that it draws these, these lines. Um, and what it's basically doing is saying, oh, is if X is between zero and um, 0.5 uh, and Y is between these, then it should be over here. And <laughs> so it, it has all these like square boundaries. Uh, that's basically how decision trees work. Um, and that's how they're able to fit in these high dimensions. Uh, they draw all these boundaries around everything. Um, and that's how they work. So they're very flexible. You can fit very uh, complicated things, but uh, they are just drawing these uh, square boundaries. And so they typically will suffer from some amount of uh, out of distribution extrapolation. Um, but if it's in distribution, uh, you know, it should do pretty decently. Um, yeah. 